I'm still very critical of this commission text. And of the extremist position taken by our rapporteur. Now, as uh, Madame Rosbeck said, perhaps some of the next thing we're going to hear is that uh, caffeine's dangerous, so it's going to be banned from coffee, and that's what I fear, really. If you look at this text with the amendments, it really is calling for the death of smokers, I think. Yes, I completely uh, agree that we should uh, try and reduce sales to minors, but a citizen is, an, um, an adult citizen is um, perfectly capable of deciding whether they want to kill themselves by smoking or not. It's, they know the problems, the, the issues, they know whether it's a revolting habit or not. It's up to them entirely. You don't have to find your uh, favourite flavour and so on because that means the legislators have decided you can't, you can't smoke because it's not good for you. No, I don't think this is right because uh, this could spread to caffeine, for example. You, you could say this could uh, spread to dangerous sports or fat because fat's bad for you too. Let's, be, let's ban alcohol because that's bad for you. So uh, this can happen with everything. Now, we're, 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 uh, I've seen um, the poster for this convention sponsored by the rapporteur uh, and what that says uh, this will be a state where everything is legislated everything's bad for you now uh, giving out the right information at, at school level well that doesn't happen in Italy I don't know if that happens elsewhere in the EU but you don't have courses in schools talking about the dangers of smoking or uh, other things you have a little bit but not much really so let's give out information and when people are um, 18 they can choose what they want to do without uh, giving problems to other people so uh, yes it's it's fine to ban smoking in closed places uh, it's fine to ban smoking if it bothers other people but if you are an adult then you should be able to, to should be able to decide whether you want to f smoke a f cigarette you shouldn't be it shouldn't be legislated if you want to smoke uh, a long cigarette a thin one a, a f short fat one then you should be able to we shouldn't be telling people what to do and then we've got colleagues that are saying that we should legalize uh, soft drugs and they're fine apparently they want to liberalize those so fine well no this is rubbish i think th with this issue we are opening up this issue of uh, impinging on uh, public uh, on personal decisions in terms of electronic cigarettes well those i'm against seeing those as medical devices because uh, most people that i know that want to stop smoking for them, electronic cigarettes become a substitute. They aren't a means of giving up. You smoke an electronic uh, cigarette instead of a normal cigarette. So I don't think it's the same as a pr uh, prosthesis, for example. If it's a medical device, then that's the same as a prosthesis. You could just go around smoking an electronic cigarette for the rest of your life. No, that's pointless. A medical device. It's a substitute. It's different, but it's not a medical device. So finally, I would say that uh, it's a very interesting uh, study from uh, the Parliament's uh, internal department here, uh, looking at uh, the uh, Employment Committee's point of view and so on. Uh, I'm not sure about the international trade, uh, the the impact on smuggling and so on. It's not clear what the uh, effect would be of changing the packaging and so on. This study from the Parliament's offices raises doubts on what the Commission's done and what we're doing. So I would uh, stress that personal individual freedom should be utmost for politicians. And we can't tell people what they choose to do if they're adults and have information at their disposal. Thank you very much. Anderson, who's shadow reporter for the GUE, please. Ah, so, he comes gleich aus dem Regel. Ah, he'll be joining us in a second. Okay, we'll come back to them when they're back. Okay, well, now I have a list of speakers that I have at the moment, and I've forgotten some of them. Please let me know. 
Richard Seber, Renate Sommer, Jorge Kramer, Peter Leser, Bat Rossi, Landers Olmut, Anders Perello, Rodriguez, Astrid de Lange, Christopher Ferner, and Vistrella. As I have I forgotten anyone? Gardini, I can put your name on the list. And I suggest that we have three minutes speaking time so that we can fit everybody in. So that everybody has the opportunity to speak on this important issue. Richard Sabre, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'd like to thank those colleagues who are experts on this uh, matter, especially the rapporteur and our shadow rapporteurs and those in the Secretariat who have had to deal with over 300 amendments. It's quite a, a task they had ahead of them. I think that here in the Parliament we do have a role to play as legislators and I also think that it is up to us to ensure that this product, which is a reality in our world, is made as safe as possible. And our task here in the committee is to deal with health policies. So I think that we don't want a nanny state where everything's forbidden, but we do need to try and work together with each other to move forward in the right direction. And I think that uh, we want to reduce cigarette consumption, and uh, those cigarettes which are still smoked or the tobacco products which are still used must be as safe as possible. There are some member states uh, who have uh, certain conventions and certain customs to deal with, but there's also the needs of industry to be dealt with, for example... Um, additional products. Uh, uh, we have to ensure that everything added to cigarettes are safe as well. This is why um, 94, for example, remember 94, this is an important contribution um, if we're, this is the direction we want to head in. Now, secondly, if we look at passive smoking, which affects particularly uh, children and pregnant women. We have uh, 354, um, 54, 55. These are looking at this issue, and they're particularly important. It's not an issue of whether or not you can smoke, but whether you are forcing somebody else to smoke and then uh, harming their health. Also, it's not just a question of uh, the pictures on the packaging. The studies have shown the effect of this. I think that electronic cigarettes, this is got, do they, whether or not they have a role to play. We've looked at what the Commission thinks about this, but I do think we need to look into more uh, depth as to uh, what role they have to play and whether it will be useful. To con I think the discussion has shown us that uh, feelings have run high here and there has been a lot of lobbying around people who are trying to apply pressure to us and I think the, there's a lot at stake for industry and I think that legislators here in Parliament and in the Member States do have to take their role seriously. Otherwise, this could have seriously negative consequences for um, industry and the sector. We've seen this with Dali Gate, for example. Thank you very much, Richard Seber. Renata Zoma, please. No, we haven't reached that stage yet, says uh, Renata Zoma. Yes. Can I remind you, we're still talking about legal products. So we really do need to not, we shouldn't really try and go too far here. Let's call a spade a spade. I am in favour of making these products safer. I can go along with it. I don't want people to start smoking as young people either. But there are laws already existing in member states protecting the health of young people. Member states are already involved in this. This is, goes for other products as well, such as alcohol. So we can't necessarily uh, just use a, a European regulation to do this. I think that if you look at the crisis underway in the EU, perhaps there may well be a fairly cynical uh, feeling around. If you look at the Commission as well, yes, I mean, what are we going to do now? We're trying to uh, cull from... Uh, Jobs uh, just 
I mean, they say they will place these elsewhere, but where? I mean, what are we going to do if we get rid of the tobacco industry? We mustn't uh, forget that the people who will be losing their jobs are consumers themselves. And yes, we have the IMCO committee to deal with this, but we shouldn't just uh, forget the other aspects of this question. We have a certain responsibility towards our citizens who we represent and who need jobs. May I remind you again, we're talking about perfectly legal products. Now, I think the argument about e-cigarettes is false for small and medium-sized businesses or the, the producers of uh, small and medium, the small producers of uh, cigarettes are uh, distant selling. I don't think these arguments hold water, nor does um, that of the plain packaging. I don't think it will uh, discourage smoking, but rather encourage it. I think that we need to include safety warnings on packages, but also on the cigarettes themselves. This is an opportunity to uh, prevent counterfeiting, which could be encouraged by plain, plain packaging and sh will indeed um, protect the health of the consumers. A lot has been said about e-cigarettes. I also agree that they should be sold in pharmacies. Mm, we could talk about licensing for this, but uh, this is something we need regulation for shisha, for example, as well. Um, it's not necessarily dangerous, but it is a, a gateway drug, as it were, for young people. We need to ensure... Um, that special exceptions, uh, schnus for example, uh, um, we can uphold these. We have to ensure that we don't have, uh, um, we don't go too far with this. I mean, snuff for example, this is pure tobacco, but it's less damaging. And uh, Madam uh, McAvan has talked about this as well. Something else which is important is delegated acts. There are a large number of delegated acts granted to the Commission here along these lines, and we do have to think that this is really granted, uh, this is really taking uh, power away from the European legislations. This is giving broad and generalised rights to the uh, Commission for the future. And I think that this is somewhere we have to be aware as uh, members of Parliament. There are some delegated acts dealing with purely technical matters, which is fair enough. But this, other issues, we really can't just hand these over, uh, hook, line and sinker, to the Commission. Thank you very much. Next, the uh, GUI shadow rapporteur, Ms. Anderson, uh, who's just been in Reggie. Ms. Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, for your indulgence, and thanks again to the continuing hard work of the Rapporteur, Linda McCavan. Apologies uh, for having to leave during the discussion. I had to photo my opinion on the Regit Committee, as the Chair has said. We're still looking for over the whopping 1,360 amendments, which I'm sure many of the MEPs are doing likewise, which have been sub submitted to the Tobacco Product Directive, and it's clear that the tobacco, the tobacco industry has been formidable and almost impressive in the massive lobbying efforts. I was heartened, however, to see some amendments from colleagues similar to those of my own, which seek to protect the health of our citizens rather than the coffers of the tobacco companies. I'm sure during the time that I haven't been here that the issue of standardised packaging has already been discussed today, but I'd just like to highlight some important developments which have been happening this week in my own country, Ireland. Although it was a week when it was revealed that the Taoiseach and the Kenny and two of his senior ministers had engaged and met with the tobacco industry, the first time I believe that an Irish Premier had done so, there was a significant silver lining when it was announced that the South of Ireland has made the decision to move towards 100% standardised packaging. In doing so, it will become the first member state of the EU and the second in the world after Australia to introduce such measures. Hopefully this strong stance will help set an important precedent and the tone for the ongoing discussions in both the Council and here in the European Parliament. Dealing with the issues of characterising flavours, where the Commission proposed to allow certain additives or flavouring as long as they do not produce a so-called characterising flavour, 
I would favour a complete ban on additives which are superfluous to the manufacturing process, and this includes any additive which could increase the attractiveness of the tobacco product. I believe that the Commission's proposals will be difficult to implement in practice and what the Commission has called the independent test panels. The purpose of many additives is to refine or mask the harsh taste of tobacco without actually producing a clear, distinguishable flavour of its own. For example, one of my own amendments seeks to tackle the use of sugar in tobacco products. I don't think it should be granted an exemption. Sugar is clearly an ingredient which seeks to increase the palatability of tobacco products and therefore increases its attractiveness. The WHO guideline states that we should ban or restrict ingredients which may be used to increase palatability. And to that end, I know there has been concern about potential challenges in the event of some people supporting a photon for menthol to be retained. And some of that perhaps could be applied if we retain sugar. Any flavour or taste, whether or not it is characterising, should not be permitted if we are to leave the best chance or to have the best chance of dissuading people, especially young people, from initiating tobacco usage, I would prefer to see a positive list. And to that end, we have co-signed an amendment with, from one of the other MEPs of additives which may be used to, in tobacco products. Only additives, additives which have received exempt approval should be admitted. I'm sure many of the other issues have been covered here today. And once again, I want to thank Linda McCavan for all her hard work and efforts. And again, thank you, Chair, for your indulgence. Thank you very much. Holger Kram is the next speaker on the list. Thank you very much. Well, uh, debate is essential in a democracy in terms of an exchange of views and uh, arguments are part of that. And I think this is a loss of uh, de democracy if we're, not, if we're going to stigmatise uh, certain arguments because of certain lobbying and organised interests. Um, so Karl uh, Heinz Florence, I think... Uh, you really uh, were a bit low here, so I think we should bring up the level of of uh, debate up and look at exchanging uh, points of view rather than uh, who's hit out against who. Uh, uh, we can talk about that over a coffee, I'm sure. But Renata Zama, I, I. We can do that here, says the chair. Well, we I've only got three minutes, Carl Heinz. Well, I think we can talk about this over coffee, says the chair. But uh, picking up on what Renata Sommer says and others that have said that this directive goes far too far and is much too restrictive, and I would just like to concentrate on a couple of points that the Commission is suggesting regarding packaging. This is very restrictive, detailed, uh, looking at Articles 12 and 13, I'm wondering why the e e the uh, Commission doesn't make its own tobacco products. Uh, this isn't to do with market economy. There's no more room for manoeuvre uh, with all of this. Uh, here, the uh, EU has signed a WA declaration saying that they're, uh, they recognise that 50% of... Uh, what 50% uh, warning on packaging is enough in terms of health warnings. So there's no point. 75%. Uh, what is the added value there for health? This isn't going to make uh, fewer people smoke if you've got 75% instead of 50%. Why not go for 100% or plain packaging? So what is the... Uh, where is the scientific argument here? In addition, there... Uh, s some proposal, proposals that don't make sense, the roll your own products, for example, the Commission uh, wants the soft packaging to be banned, that this, these, uh, uh, the, the, this is sold in, and wants them to be sold in tins instead. So why can't you have them in soft, soft packaging? Why would you need to put them in different packaging? I can't understand that at all. 
So uh, I would like to know the reasoning behind that uh, from the Commission. And um, I, I see little room for manoeuvre in terms of uh, make-up of the project, but uh, the, the, the Commission could just say that uh, packaging shouldn't have any elements that uh, and that the, the, the don't su suggest um, positive things for society. This sounds like communist language, and this is not democratic. Who decides what's positive for society? Uh, to have this in delegated acts. So I'd like to know from the Commission what that uh, wording is supposed to mean. I think that in the proposal as it is at the moment, uh, is only going to make people more Eurosceptic. There's a growing trend in Europe uh, of people being more critical about the EU, and I think we're only going to play in the hands with this. Yeah. Peter Lisa, please. Thank you very much, Chair. I will try and deal with these um, issues technically, but I... Uh, I understand that um, car, that uh, Mr. Florence is a bit worked up, but uh, not all of what he was talking about was technical. Looking at uh, CO2 limits for cars, Mr. Kramer said in a big German paper that the Envy Committee of the EP is ma mostly made up of uh, uh, climate policy dreamers, and that was what Mr. Kramer said. So... We have come. We have come up with compromises. We've agreed on the compromises, and this is not a good way of fighting our Euroscepticism. Coming up with that kind of quote. Now back to business. Uh, I mainly support the Commission's proposal. I think it's quite balanced. Uh, we've got amendments that go in both both directions: size and type of packaging. Uh, I would like to thank Linda. Uh, Avon for agreeing that we don't, we shouldn't be over-regulating. Uh, I don't think we need to argue about that anymore. In terms of additives, Carlisle France has said the main things, and I think that for e-cigarettes we need to uh, come up with something cleverer. One of the most important things is uh, amendments uh, 1325 uh, 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 55 and 54, and uh, another one. Uh, I think we need to look very carefully at them. The aim being to uh, reduce the risk of passive smoking, particularly for children here. If in Brussels or elsewhere in any of our countries, if you go on the street and ask people uh, whether they think that smoking causes lung cancer, most people know this, but... Uh, I've uh, I saw a study from before I was at the EP that uh, that, that says that uh, smoking causes child mortality uh, and makes asthma worse and so on and leads to other illnesses and I think there are hard facts backing this up and I think we should make more use of those facts. There is this idea of freedom and people deciding whether they do themselves damage or not but uh, if you're doing kids damage then you shouldn't have freedom to do that we need clearer rules there so uh, it would call upon to people to support those amendments the commission says that shouldn't be here but in the comitology pr procedure uh, we went through all of that and a lot of people were involved but commission uh, please we have uh, the right of co-decision and you can't just expect us to, uh, to discuss this uh, for months and months and months and uh, for the Commission to try and change everything in comatology. We have a voice here and we shouldn't have too much comatology and I would like these amendments to be supported, please. Thank you, Peter Lisa. Paolo Barzolozzi is next, please. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you, Chair. I would like to thank the uh, rapporteur for the work that she's done. But uh, uh, alongside other Italian colleagues from the Environment, uh, Environment Committee, we have proposed quite a lot of um, uh, amendments here, and they all uh, put into words our concerns here about the positive, possible negative impacts on internet, intellectual property 
rights and competition in the internal market and national markets, also safety of citizens and so on. And they don't seem to uh, go in the favour of uh, public health. So we have a lot of uh, doubts here. I'm thinking about th the legal basis chosen by the Commission. Uh, and the idea is to be to improve the functioning of the, mar of the internal market, and this is reflected in the text. The unanimous position from many national parliaments, including the um, Italian Senate, have said that uh, they don't that they don't go along with the subsidiarity part of the draft directive, and uh, what's proposed regarding sales of cigarettes and packaging don't seem to go in the aim of the proposal here, but they only uh, interrupt the functioning of the internal market and they are measures that member states should be uh, able to decide upon. The same goes for uh, the plain packaging proposals. And we think that uh, having more warnings that it should only be with a health impact as opposed to as opposed to interfering with international intellectual property rights and the TRIPS agreement and we have similar concerns for those measures uh, that uh, that uh, are for products of reduced risks and so on, and also electronic cigarettes, uh, which a lot has been said about al already. There are a lot of uh, powers given to the Commission with all of this, and we should reduce this. And there is not uh, a lot of justification for many of these powers which should be left for member states. All of these concerns are reflected by the amendments that we have lodged, uh, which have uh, uh, found the way into the proposal. And we should always look at uh, consumer health and to drawing to uh, reducing illegal sales and smuggling, that would be more in line with the aim of this. I fully believe that the uh, that we would get much better results in, in terms of bringing down smoking numbers instead of uh, having the measures in the proposal, but, uh, but rather making sure that we invest in information campaigns and prevention campaigns and uh, get more involvement from consumers, and particularly for from young people, including pregnant women. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, first of all, uh, I want to say I agree with a lot of what Martina and Anderson has said, and I congratulate the Irish Government on the stance they're taking. I think it's really good news. It saddens me, this debate, actually, a little bit, to hear people equating smoking with coffee and things like that. I, I think it brings the debate down to a level that it shouldn't be. This is too important. It's not about stopping people smoking. Nobody wants to ban smoking. It's not about that freedom of choice. But, you know, we can't underestimate the massive issue this is to do with public health. One in two people who use tobacco die from it. One in two. It's a massive cost to our health services, and it's actually, more importantly, a massive cost in lives. This isn't, uh, this isn't a silly little issue. This is too important an issue to take down to that level. I've sub submitted a number of amendments on different issues with colleagues from across political groups, uh, and uh, so I won't go into them. Just on, on e-cigarettes, I just want to say it should be treated like every other smoking cessation product, in my view. And, you know, nobody will change my mind on that. But I want to talk about one particular issue, and that's about point-of-sale tobacco displays. 
because that's not really been mentioned much in the debate, a number of member states already have or are implementing bans on displaying tobacco in shops. And evidence shows that point-of-sale displays do influence people's brand recognition and likelihood to start smoking, especially for teenagers. For example, research in New Zealand found that children exposed to displays were almost three times more likely to start smoking. These displays are like billboards for the tobacco industry in every corner shop, news agents and supermarket. And that's why the tobacco industry has been running a campaign to get corner shops to lobbyists. Uh, I think it's right to keep tobacco products hidden from view. Many will say that isn't an EU competence, but the tobacco industry has taken countries to court over their display bans, claiming that they distort the internal market, as happened in Norway in 2011. That's why we have to deal with it at EU level. It is rumoured that dis a display ban was in the original Commission proposals, but was changed at the last minute, and that, I think, is a real shame. I hope the committee will seriously consider this measure, which could be just another tool, a useful tool, in our fight against tobacco and starting young people smoking. And it's especially effective in saving that next generation from the disease, death and disability caused by tobacco. Andres Barrel Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair. Yes, this is an ambitious proposal. And we haven't amended any directive on this for about 12 years, so this is a step in the right, right direction. But once again, we see the whole conglomerate of interests uh, that become evident every time we deal with this. I think lobbying here has been excessive, uh, particularly in Spain, which is a tobacco-producing uh, country. We've had to spend more time on explaining what the directive is not about than about what it is about. I mean, what... We're seeking here is a balanced result between a position of banning smoking totally and uh, on this position that only seeks profit. Mm. We think that we should maintain uh, uh, exceptions. Um, uh, for example, for uh, cigars, because young people don't take up smoking from Cuban cigars. So that's something we can accept. And, uh, of course, there's this amendment on 10%, yes, but if you look at countries where um, um, people smoke the, the, the most, perhaps not, we have to look at uh, the situation in different countries. Of people who smoke tobacco, they smoke tobacco, they don't smoke uh, uh, cinnamon or something else. So we have, uh, have to look at those additives, and we also have to look at uh, sugars. Some additives are ingredients, such as the burley uh, leaf. If they take out sugar, then it's, it's an important uh, um, concept. And just like when you have uh, concentrated uh, orange juice, you have to add a little bit of water in order to dilute it. And here, you know, you add a little bit of sugar in the process of condensing. It's actually an, an ingredient. It's not about uh, uh, adulterating the product itself. So we have to differentiate between, you know, different additives. And we have to try to reach a consensus. But in seeking and to strike a balance, we must not lose sight of what is the ultimate goal of this directive, and that is preventing young people from taking up smoking and protecting public health. And the health commissioner has sort of in initiated some of this, and this is uh, are things that are also being discussed in the health committee, and we have to put it like that to uh, the manufacturers. And we have to uh, stand strong in the face of all the uh, interests that are lobbying and we must not lose sight of uh, public health goals. But at the same time, we must not become so radical that we just want to ban everything and interfere directly with daily lives of, uh, Europe's, the daily lives of Europe's citizens. We have to strike the right balances. Thank you. As this is Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, like many others, but not all I've heard, is, is my focus, of course, to make sure that uh, my main focus will be uh, that uh, the tobacco industry doesn't get any new consumers or users and that those that exist do not harm others. And I think in that regard it's interesting to note that uh, ever since Belgium introduced the smoking ban in all uh, restaurants and pubs, uh, the number of early uh, child uh, births has actually gone down considerably. So there is a direct link between those two issues. 
issues. Uh, and I would support uh, Peter Lees' amendments, which I have co-signed, on uh, the effects of smoking um, on unborn uh, children. Uh, but I would like to uh, underline uh, another issue uh, primarily in, in the three minutes that I have, and that is um, that already the Framework Convention uh, on Tobacco says that members uh, should ban the use of products aimed at children, so the toys and the chocolate cigarettes, Linda, which, which I also got, not at Christmas, but at St. Nicholas, so a couple of weeks earlier. Uh, and, and nowadays it's unimaginable that you would give your child chocolate cigarettes because we would actually use them to imitate smoking, but they are not yet completely banned. So we do have an issue that we should address here. And, and what is more worrying is that nowadays the products trying to lure in children are actually more advanced than the chocolate cigarettes and the toys that we know. And I am talking basically, for example, uh, about the water pipe or the, this shisha pen, um, which has no tobacco, no nicotine, just flavor and vapor. But there's two problems uh, with those. First of all, that we don't know what these flavorings actually do health-wise. There's, there's not enough research on them. And secondly, they are very appealing to young children because they're shiny pens in pink and green. They have a lovely little LED light at the end of it. So what, when you inhale, uh, the little LED light actually lights up. Well, well, that's fantastic to young children. And we have children as young as eight using these and having access to these. Um, and in, in my view, they're an ideal stepping stone for the industry to, to get people into real smoking. And currently the legislation doesn't cover these. Um, uh, and, and we have to deal with this issue. And as far as I'm concerned, we actually ban them, like the chocolate cigarettes, which I would also like to formally ban. And I understand that Mrs. Rees has a put forward similar amendments. And I've tried to, to it's difficult to legally frame or, or wor have a wording to ban these products. I've tried to do it via a category of imitation tobacco products, which could cover them, but, but I'm flexible on the wording. I don't care how we arrange it as long as we, we do it. That's my signal to you. And the final point on the delegated acts, uh, please be aware that it's not only this House that should be con uh, concerned about uh, the Commission's attempt to actually um, uh, draw all the power to, to revise this legislation to, to itself, uh, may I remind the Commission that they are not a directly elected body. Uh, there's actually a number of national parliaments also very concerned with this lack of oversight that we're creating in future if we do give the European Commission this, this extensive amount uh, of power uh, to, to, to delegate, uh, to, of, to, to uh, arrange future revisions or partial revisions via delegated act, acts. I know it's a concern of the Dutch national parliament and there's a number uh, more of those. So, um, I support Linda there to see that we, uh, to, in saying that we would actually have to, well, limit the ambitions of the Commission there. Thank you very much. Bedankt. Next speaker is Christopher Fiona. Christopher Fiona. Thank you very much, Mr. President. First, I'd like to thank Linda for, for identifying the two routes on snooze that one has to make a choice between, uh, in that either to, to allow it in the European Union or to uh, re respect the the accession treaty and, and to exclude it more or less along the lines that, that Ms. Ries pointed out. Uh, because I, I think it's important to note the fact that just leaving it aside, so to say, not addressing it, is, is not to make that choice. One has to amend it one way or another. Because what we have on the table now is a changing, it's changing the game. Uh, it's the change to the, to the current situation. Because now we say we ban it on the internal market, but we regulate it in Sweden. <laughs> And that's hard for people in Sweden to understand. I know people are so tired of this question. But again, if we would, like this, allow cigarettes but ban snus, but regulate snus in Sweden, again, it would be like allowing vodka, banning, red, uh, banning wine, but then saying that we regulate red wine and, and ban red wine in, in France. And, and if that would be the case, people would probably, in France, understand that, that it would make people upset. I would personally, in that choice between those two lines, to not to your surprise, argue that, that we should allow it. Because I think that, that it's bad to, to ban or regulate harder the less harmful product, tobacco product. Uh, a little bit along the same lines around, that we've heard around these cigarettes that Fregris and, and, and Mr. Callahan put forward, that it's, it's strange to have less accessibility than cigarettes. I don't have to repeat 
the facts around. You all know that snus is dramatically less harmful and that Sweden has the least number of tobacco-related harm, even though we consume as much tobacco as the rest of the world, and that the problem, the problem of tobacco is the, uh, the combustion. <laughs> Smoking kills. It's not that snooze is good for you. It's just so extremely dangerous to smoke that anything else is dramatically less harmful. Uh, you know, don't suck on an exhaustion pipe of a car either. It will kill you as well. Uh, and, and, and that's the reason that, that it's, it's strange to ban one of the ways that doesn't uh, give, have the same health effect. Uh, I, I, I do understand and, and accept, like Karl Heinz Florens says, that there, this line of actually allowing it may, may not be the main, but to rather take the route of saying to exclude it. I, because, and I would say, I don't want to force snooze on any country that doesn't want it. That's not my aim here. But, but I would like to say that, and I think that's important, like, like uh, our friend uh, from the ECR uh, said, that it's, it's actually not only a question about Sweden. It is, in Denmark, there's a big fight about snus as well, because they actually sell snus. Uh, Norway, through the EA agreement, is also affected by this, and it's a big question in Finland as well, because it is a cultural thing. And, and therefore, I think that the more reasonable thing to do would, would be to say that member states that, that want shouldn't be banned from, from having snus. So I think a may has to be somewhere in the text. Uh, if, if I would try to find a compromise in that aspect. But, but I'm happy that we start to see that just leaving it aside won't solve the problem. We have to make a choice here and accept at least one or two amendments on SNUS to solve it and to keep status quo, if that is what people would like to have. Thank you very much. Thank you. It is Estrella. Thank you very much, Chair. Let me start by thanking Linda McAvan for her hard work on such a controversial issue. I think she took her job very seriously indeed. Now, protection of public health is a goal which we should all aim for. It's been proved that tobacco is very damaging indeed to the health and that it can kill. For this reason, we should do our utmost to ensure that smokers, above all young people, are aware of the size of the problem. However, we should bear in mind a number of points. We have to be reasonable, of course. For example, industry. They are right to be concerned and to express these concerns as regards the possible increase in counterfeiting and uh, illegal trade. I think that uh, new legislation in this area should aim to avoid counterfeiting and illegal trade. As regards the situation in Portugal in particular, in Portugal all tobacco advertising is illegal across the board, it's completely illegal, direct, indirect, whatever, it's all illegal. But I presented uh, an amendment to, to Article 8 with other colleagues and I'd like to thank uh, Linda for her support uh, for this amendment. This is related to packaging, soft cigarette packaging. We've got uh, a, a varied height uh, but a fixed width in Portugal. The only way in which these packagings can change once the minimum dimension has been imposed relates to the fact that the, the, in Portugal the, the brand name is removed, especially in the Azores. Now the effect of this would be absolutely devastating to these areas. They've got no real possibility of uh, uh, implementing these changes which would uh, uh, require enormous investments in the tobacco industry for and for reasons which are very well known in this current context it would be absolutely impossible this would increase unemployment which is very high indeed in the outermost areas especially of my country 
this is not necessarily a health reason. We're not talking about shorter cigarettes. If the if we change the size of the packaging, it's not going to affect the tobacco content. Uh, but it it may well uh, push uh, young people to take up smoking. For this reason, we are opposed, and I'm concluding here. We are opposed to the proposal prevented by the Liberals' shadow rapporteur, that is, of increasing the size and weight of the packaging. I think this would result in serious problems as well, as regards to the uh, um, intellectual property right, patents, uh, brand names. I don't think this is something which uh, we're uh, particularly uh, concerned about. It may not be affecting uh, soft packaging either. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gardini, Ms. Gardini, thank you. Well, uh, a lot's been said already. Overall, I think we're all singing from the same hymn sheet when we say that we agree that smoking's bad and that we should reduce the use of tobacco as much as we can. Uh, we all agree when we say that our priorities are to uh, protect young people and to stop people starting smoking and also we should protect people from passive smoking. That's something that Mr. Leeser said very well. But we need to do this with a more effective instrument. I don't think we agree on the instruments used. This is the first time that Europe, which normally tries to come up with harmonised rules in terms of product labelling, where 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 Europe's looking at the design with uh, rules that seem more commercial in nature than to do with health. I'm Italian. I don't believe that Italy, as people sometimes say, is ambivalent here. For years, Italy has been leading the fight against tobacco. Now, the the official data from the Italian Senate says that from 2003 to 2012. The percentage of smokers went from 27.6 to 20.8 percent, so 6.9 percent fewer smokers. I think that's a great outcome. So uh, the 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 strategy we've used is quite different to the one the Commission wants us to take. I agree with uh, Ms. Estrella. I don't understand what uh, difference. Uh, a, uh, a smaller or larger cigarette can make or a different packaging for a smoker. Uh, I believe more in bans in certain places, education starting from very sm small children, that will bear fruit. We should uh, remember, as is said in a hearing, that uh, Swiss researchers that have looked into this, people that know smokers, people that are the dependent on uh, a certain product. If they don't find it in one place, they'll go elsewhere and buy it. And this is uh, something that uh, will make um, smuggling rise and also contraband uh, uh, counterfeit cigarettes rise, which is something we've seen recently. We're all aware of what's in these uh, counterfeit cigarettes, which are the worst ones, contaminated cigarettes, bad t tobacco bits of plastic you get in some of these cigarettes as well. So this is a big health risk. This is something that we need to stop, this rise in counterfeit cigarettes. And this is something that standardised packaging will make it easier. This is something that the study has thrown up. We shouldn't create more public health problems. Because looking at what might happen if you have to deal with people that are poisoned from these products, the, these materials that we don't know what they are in these counterfeit cigarettes, you don't know what's in them. There have been uh, cases of poisoning and on the longer term people could get terrible diseases from this. And finally regarding e-cigarettes, we're very concerned about all this and looking at uh, lowering the risk for new generations. I think we should 
think about this because we can't stop member states introducing health policies that reduce the risk of smoking. So there are lots of things we need to look at more. I'd like to thank the rapporteur. I think she's doing a great job here. Thank you. That brings us to the end of the list of speakers. If this is one of the biggest legislative packages that uh, we've been dealing with recently in our committee. It's very contro controversial. It's quite clear that uh, up to 700,000 people die in the EU from the effects of smoking. And uh, if you look at this from a member state point of view, this is something that Karl-Heinz Florence brought to the debate. If every day in each member state uh, a plane were to crash, then uh, in the next three days plane travel would be banned in the EU. And uh, there's been no full ban on this yet, and th this is the dilemma that we're in. If you're 60 years old there and you've smoked all your life, then you're not going to stop smoking just because of this legislation. This legislation that we've got on the table with the amendments uh, is intended to stop new generations getting into uh, getting addicted to tobacco. That is the aim of this piece of legislation. And where I'm from, we t we have uh, a saying. You have to leave the church and the, and the town, which is basically keep things in proportion. And this is something we should do. We should uh, we should press ahead with health reform to stop people taking up smoking. But for these innovative pro products, we've had a workshop on this, and we weren't that happy with the workshop on e-cigarettes. And... I don't uh, fully support this limit for the e-cigarettes where they're ba basically banned uh, and they wouldn't be uh, available in pharmacies. This is something that people just carry on smoking with as opposed to, to stopping smoking. They use it to carry on uh, with tobacco. I'm not sure if this is the right place for legislation for the e-cigarette. This is something that the rapporteur and, uh, and the shadow rapporteurs will need to deal with. And Linda McEvan will have to deal with these uh, thousand and more amendments from the committee. And hopefully we will be able to uh, put them together when we go to the vote. And that this bit of legislation will be dealt with before the elections. And I think that would be a good thing for us to do because we put pressure on the Commission to try and get this through as quickly as possible. Uh, there have been difficulties with the Commission, particularly following the change of the com Commissioner. Uh, shortly before Christmas, they came out with a proposal, uh, a month earlier than we had expected, so we we're happy about that, and we hope that uh, it will have a happy end, as it were, with the approach of uh, keeping things uh, in proportion and looking... At, uh, are we trying to square the circle or what? And uh, I have full faith in the rapporteur and uh, I'd like to give the floor to the Commission and then to the rapporteur. A lot of questions have been raised here and we've taken the time we needed to today and perhaps you could answer the questions raised by our colleagues here. And then we'll hear from the rapporteur. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, first, I would like to wish uh, my wishes and thanks the reporter for excellent and hard work in this file. Also, shadow reporters and honorable members of Parliament for comments, questions, and amendments. Uh, I would like to focus on some, uh, some questions, but also reiterate uh, the justification of Commission proposals. So first, uh, on ingredients regulations. The Commission uh, proposed ban of tobacco products with the characteristic flavors, for example, uh, strong smell of test of uh, vanilla or menthol. We suggested this, as reporters said, because it's attractive to young people and make it easier to start smoking. We see a growing trend of fruit and flowering, uh, flowering such as vanilla, cherry, and chocolate coming to the new products. We see the new 
innovations, well, like uh, already mentioned, mental capsules integrated in the filter of the cigarettes. And we see significant increase of market share of menthol in many member states. This is also clear in, in evidence we are able to gather. Evidence also suggests that availability of menthol cigarettes increase the likelihood of experimentation and regular smoking. We also have data showing the flavors play a big role in initiation that, uh, in other age groups. So in addition, products with characteristic flavors can easily mislead the perception of harm. This is why we try to, to regulate this. We come back to the uh, list of, of uh, positive loss ingredients in, 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 the, in, the, in the end. The second of, on packaging and labeling. Numbers of questions were raised around this, and I would like to remind that uh, in studies we, we were able to show that it's clear that bigger uh, warnings, bigger pictures and, uh, are, are working, and they, they is also mentioned by, by, by a reporter. Uh, so we propose the, the 75 and, uh, percent, and we believe this is a balanced, uh, uh, balanced proposal. In this context, we, we need also remember, as already was said in the, in the, in the debate, that uh, in Belgium, for example, when uh, you have to use three languages, uh, already uh, those uh, warnings cover 65 of uh, the pack. We also found in the research, experimental research from Canada, in the case, the size from 75 onwards produced uh, statistically significant effects. Again, there's evidence for this, not because we, we just imagined this 75. Very important uh, issue on electric electronic cigarettes. Uh, let me clarify uh, our, our position in this field. Uh, the Commission wants electronic cigarettes to develop the full potential as effective but also as a safe smoking cessation products. We want the products on market, but we want them to be safe, effective, and good quality. When, effective, when reflecting on, on appropriate uh, regulatory framework for electronic cigarettes, we ask ourselves three questions. How we can assure that electronic cigarettes are safe and respect good manufacture practice? How we can assure the electronic cigarettes develop this full cessation potential and, and, and helps people to quit smoking? And finally, how to be sure that electronic cigarettes do not develop into attractive products for young people and develop nicotine addiction? We studied this and we found the answer on all these questions in the pharmaceutical regulations and this is why I suggest electronic cigarettes uh, with nicotine level above the center threshold as, uh, to be regulated as medicine. The threshold based on the current uh, authorization uh, system for other nicotine uh, replacement therapies. We also discuss and study the uh, special regime, but because of these questions we ask and the, and the answer we got to study this, 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 uh, this, this uh, problem, we, we, we really strongly believe that the proposal uh, has, has logic and, 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 uh, and, 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 and may work. Uh, finally, uh, was question about the Commission communication on uh, smuggling. Uh, so I'd like to answer that this is now uh, proposed by f 5th of June. Uh, there will be adopted a communication on action plan on smuggling of cigarettes. Uh, this initiative led by uh, Commissioner Semeta but uh, is linked to the proposal on traceability and security features. Uh, on delegated acts, uh, uh, this came because, you know, when we were looking for the solution and also following the international scientific development in this field, we, we, we understood that we, we, we have numbers of technical issues we, we should regulate this way. Uh, delegation power provides clear and consistent criteria. We are giving limited uh, discretion of the, to the Commission. Scientific international market developments will be taken into account. And finally, <clears throat> having said this, uh, we noted some movement also in the Council to bet, uh, better define and conditions for using the delegated ask. We are ready uh, to look into such proposals, but we need to assure that the directive allows for sufficient flexibility in terms of scientific development. And final comment concerning the, the economic debate. Uh, in one hand, we, we, we wait 2%, only 2% of reduction, which somebody says is very limited and not ambition goal. In the, in the consumption, 
At the same time, we, 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 we show that we can uh, reduce number of smokers by 2.5 million. So we are waiting, you know, relatively uh, small economic impact on, on industry and at the same time relatively high uh, output from, uh, from, uh, from, from public health point of view. I will ask my colleagues, uh, Ms. Wimmer, to explain the issue concerning the uh, positive list uh, of ingredients and uh, use of sugar in production. Thank you. Uh, on the positive list, I would like to comment that the Commission has uh, effectively looked into this issue and has carefully analyzed the possibilities. And for, for several reasons, we have at this stage not proposed a positive list. Firstly, this area is extremely complex. There are thousands of additives and substances which are currently in use and uh, many more potentially in use. They can easily be replaced one by the other and it's extremely difficult uh, in regulatory terms to manage this. Also, a positive list would give the false impression that these additives are actually making the product safe and a good consumer product, and this is an impression which I think in, t in view of a tobacco product which always will remain harmful, which we do not want to give. Also, if we take the positive list uh, seriously, we would need, of course, to develop very strict criteria. They could, and no one at this stage knows exactly uh, what they could be. We could, they could focus on, on toxicity, on addictiveness, on attractiveness. They could also, um, uh, well, a criterion could be that they facilitate inhalation. All of this is scientifically and technically very uh, complex. And if the positive list was taken uh, well, very seriously, we would arrive probably at a situation which would have negative impacts on the tobacco growers in Europe. And this is why the Commission has gone for a more balanced approach uh, in this area. Also, I would like to uh, well, point to the fact that the management of such a list would involve huge administrative burden and uh, be quite demanding in terms of resources. That's why the Commission at this stage has not proposed a positive list. I would also like to comment on uh, the issue of standardizing packages and to make very clear that the Commission is not standardizing all packages. For example, for products other than cigarettes and roll your own, there is a full variety of packages possible under the proposal. In the area of cigarettes and roll your own, it is true, we propose a certain standardization, but the intention here is to ensure the full visibility and the effective display of the health warnings. But, for example, it's not at all the fact that we would not uh, foresee soft packs. Soft packs are completely possible under the proposal but what we want to get rid of is misleading and uh, packages which are particularly appealing to young people like these lipstick-shaped or kiddie packs. This is the intention, uh, but we are certainly ready to look into the details and we are also in our discussions with the member states in the Council, we uh, have been pointed to certain difficulties in the area of packages uh, and we are ready to look into that. It has also been suggested that the packaging provisions cause problems for the packaging industry because they would have uh, less, well, less work to do, really. <laughs> um, I think we would reply to that, that even if there is a simplification in, a certain, in certain terms of packaging, there will still be packaging to be produced. And on the other hand, the fact that there will be picture warnings, that there will be security features, uh, makes another challenge for the packaging industry and could even be more business for packaging industry to accommodate all these new requirements. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, the Commission. And then to conclude, I'll give Linda McAvan the floor as the rapporteur. 
Thank you, Chair. Well, most colleagues have gone now. It's uh, Thursday afternoon and people have to get back to their constituencies. So I'm not going to respond in, in detail to the comments that were made. Just to say, um, Mrs. Gardini talked about counterfeiting and that the, the proposals on pictures would lead to more counterfeiting. There is no evidence of that at all. Absolutely no evidence whatsoever. It's very simple to counterfeit the existing cigarette package. It costs a few cents. Counterfeiting is, is a real problem. It's a real big problem. But it's actually probably more linked to price of cigarettes than linked to packaging. So and nobody's, I've heard, heard nobody suggest that we should be cutting, cutting the price of cigarettes to compete with illegal cigarettes coming in from Belarus or from wherever. So I think we should look at the issues on their own merits and not believe... This is... To be honest, it's lobbying by the industry, which is saying this everywhere. But there's no evidence. My own government's looked into plain packaging for many years. They came up with no evidence of the link of this. So, um, because it's plain packaging anyway is not, it's big photographs, it's quite complex packaging with all the security features that we just heard about. The new packages would be much more secure than the old packages because of security features. So we can have a discussion about the size of warnings, but let's not say if you have a bigger warning, it's easier to counterfeit. That's not the case. Let's have the war discussion on the merits of the arguments um, that are here. Um, all the other issues, I think, colleagues show the breadth of um, the views and the need to discuss. I think we can reach um, an agreement here. Council is moving very quickly towards an agreement in council. Um, and um, there's, they want to get to an agreement inside this parliament and inside this commission. So um, the, the shadow rapporteurs will be meeting next week. We will start drafting compromises. We will take on board what colleagues have said here, accommodate all those who have made reasonable requests. Obviously, I'm not going to accommodate those who are trying to delete the commission proposal, but that's not the majority view of this committee. And it's not the majority view of the other committees either. On the other committees, it's true there are some who... There's one committee which is more difficult than others, but the majority in the other committees has problems with detail of the legislation, but not with the actual concept of the legislation itself. So I'm sure we can find compromises, and um, I hope colleagues will bear in mind what you said, Chair, about the numbers involved here, the 700,000 people and um, remember that we can make a difference, and if we don't choose not to make a difference, then we'll have to answer to our electorates about that, because they're, most people in Europe want tough action on smoking. You know, years ago, when we started talking about smoking bans in public places, I can remember the outcry. Oh, people will never accept this, this is terrible. Who would introduce smoking in public places again? Well, in my country, UKIP party, UK Independence Party wants to introduce smoking in bars. But the public do not want it. Nobody wants it. Because people realise that actually... And I hear talk of nanny states from the ECR group and things like this. Nobody wants to bring back smoking in restaurants and bars. And I think Mrs Gardini said this. Huge impact on public health in all our countries. So let's be brave. Let's take the bold decisions that we need to take. Um, and we have taken as legislators in the past, and um, let's see the number of smokers reduced in the future. Thank you very much, Linda McEvan. That brings us to the end of that discussion. And the 10th and the 11th of June is the date for the vote in committee, and then give uh, Linda McEvan a mandate to... Well, September is the date set for the vote in plenary. July. The vote is in July in Envy. Thank you very much to everybody for the discussion. And the next point on the agenda is the next meeting, 19th and 20th of June. And may I point out that for the one or two colleagues who are left, three or four who of you are still here, there is a workshop today on patient safety at from 3.15 ASP 1A3, Italian, French, German and interpreting provided. Those of you are heading home, bon voyage and bon appétit.
Thank you.